Well, the story I'm going to read now is called The Little Prince. This is actually a French story, and although it is a story of a prince, it is kind of different from the Cinderella story that we just read. Let's start. This starts off by a journal by a pilot who was deserted in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Once, when I was six years old, I saw a magnificent picture in a book called True Stories from Nature about the primeval forest. It was a picture of a boa constrictor in the act of swallowing an animal. Here is the copy of a drawing. In the book, it said, boa constrictors swallow their prey whole without chewing it after they are not able to move and they sleep through the six months that they need for digestion. I pondered deeply, then over the adventures of the jungle, and after some work with a colored pencil, I succeeded in making my first drawing. My drawing number one. It looks something like this. I showed my masterpiece to the grown-ups and asked them whether the drawing frightened them. But they answered, Frightened? Why should one be frightened by a hat? My drawing was not a picture of a hat. It was a picture of a boa constrictor digesting an elephant. But since the grown-ups were never able to understand it, I made another drawing. I drew the inside of a boa constrictor so that the grown-ups could see it clearly. They always need to have things explained. My drawing number two looked like this. The grown-ups' response this time was to advise me to lay aside my drawings of boa constrictors, whether from the inside or outside, and devote myself into the geography, history, arithmetic, and grammar. That is why, at the age of six, I gave up what might have been my magnificent career as a painter. I have been disheartened by the failure of my drawing number one and my drawing number two. Grown-ups never understand anything by themselves, and it is tiresome for children to always be, always and forever explaining things to them. So then I chose another profession and learned to be a pilot of airplanes. I have flown a little over all parts of the world, and it is true that geography has been very useful to me. At a glance, I can distinguish China from Arizona. If one gets lost in the night, such knowledge is valuable. In the course of this life, I have had a great many encounters with a great many people who have been concerned with matters of consequence. I have lived a great deal among grown-ups. I have seen them intimately, close at hand, and that hasn't much improved my opinion of them. Whenever I met one of them who seemed to be all clear-sighted, I tried this experiment of showing him my drawing number one, which I have always kept. I would try to find out, so, if this was a person of true understanding. But whoever it was, he or she, would always say, that is a hat. Then I would never talk to that person about boa constrictors or primeval forest or stars. I would bring myself down to this level. I would talk to him about bridge and golf and politics and neckties, and the grown-up would be greatly pleased to have met such a sensible man. So I lived my life alone, without anyone that could that I could really talk to, until I had an accident with my plane in the desert of Sahara six years ago. Something was broken in my engine, and as I have with me neither a mechanic nor any passengers, I sent myself to attempt the difficult repairs all alone. It was a question of life or death for me. I had scarcely enough drinking water to last a week. The first night then, I went to sleep on the sand and a thousand miles from any human habitation. I was more isolated than a shipwrecked sailor on a raft in the middle of the ocean. Thus you can imagine my amazement at sunrise when I was awakened by an odd little voice. It said, If you please, draw me a sheep. What? Draw me a sheep. I jumped to my feet, completely thunderstruck. I blinked my eyes hard. I looked carefully all around me, and I saw a most extraordinary extraordinarily small person who stood there examining me with great seriousness. Here you might see the best portrait that later I was able to make of him, but my drawing isn't certainly very much less charming than its model. That, however, is not my fault. The grown-ups discouraged me in my patient's career when, painter's career when I was six years old, and I never learned to draw anything except boas from the outside and boas from the inside. Now I started at the sudden apparition with my eyes fairly staring out of my head in astonishment. Remember, I had crashed in the desert a thousand miles from any inhabited region, and yet my little man seemed neither to be straying uncertainly among the sands, 
nor, the, nor to be fainting from fatigue or hunger or thirst or fear. Nothing about him gave any suggestion of a child lost in the middle of the desert, a thousand miles away from any human habitation. When at last I was able to speak, I said to him, But what are you doing here? And in answer he repeated, very slowly, as if he were speaking of a matter of great consequence. If you please, draw me a sheep. When a mystery is too overpowering, one dare not disobey. Absurd as it might seem to me, a thousand miles from any human habitation and in danger of death, I took out my pocket of sheet of paper and my fountain pen. But then I remember how my studies have been concentrated on geography, history, arithmetic, and grammar, and I told the little chap, a little crossly too, that I did not know how to draw. He answered me, That doesn't matter. Draw me a sheep. But I had never drawn a sheep, so I drew him for one of the two pictures that I have drawn so often. It was that of a boa constrictor from the outside, and I was astonishing, astonished to hear the little fellow greet it with. No, no, no. I do not want an elephant inside a boa constrictor. A boa constrictor is a very dangerous creature, and an elephant is very cubersome. Where I live, everything is very small. What I need is a sheep. Draw me a sheep. So then, I made a drawing. He looked at it carefully. Then he said, No, this sheep is already very sickly. Make me another. So I made another drawing. My friend smiled gently and indulgently. You see yourself, he said. That is not a sheep. It's a ram. It has horns. So then I did my drawing over once more. But it was rejected too, just like the others. This one's too old. I want a sheep that I will live a long time. By this time, my patience was exhausted because I was in a hurry to start talk taking my engine apart. So I tossed off this drawing and I threw out an ex explanation with it. This is only his box. The sheep you asked for is inside. I was very surprised to see a light break over the face of my young judge. That is exactly the way I wanted it. Do you think that sheep will have to have a great deal of grass? Why? Because where I live, everything is very small. There will surely be enough grass for him, I said. It is a very small sheep that I have given you. He bent his head over the drawing. Not so small that, look, he's gone to sleep. And that is how I made the acquaintance of a little prince. It took me a long time to learn where he came from. The little prince, who asked me so many questions, never seemed to hear the ones I asked him. It was from the word dropped by chance that, little by little, everything revealed to me. The first time he saw my airplane, for instance, I shall not draw my airplane. That would be too much complicated for me. He asked me, what is this object? This is not an object. It flies. It is an airplane. It's my airplane. And I was proud to have him learn that I could fly. He cried out then, what? You dropped that down from the sky? Yes, I answered modestly. Oh, that's funny. And the little prince broke into a lovely peal of laughter, which irritated me very much. I like my misfortune to be taken seriously. Then he added, so you two come from the sky, which is your planet. At the moment, I caught a gleam of light in the impenetrable mystery of his presence, and I demanded abruptly, do you come from another planet? But he did not reply. He tossed his head gently without taking his eyes from the plane. It is true that on that, you can't have come from very far away. And he sank into reverie, which lasted a long time. Then, taking my sheep out of his pocket, he buried himself into the contemplation of his treasure. You can imagine how my curiosity was aroused by this half-confidence about the other planets. I made a great effort, therefore, to find out more on this subject. My little man, where do you come from? Where is this where I live of which you speak? Where do you want me to take your sheep? After a reflective silence, he answered, The thing that is so good about the box you have given me is that at night he can use it as his house. That is so. And if you are good, I will give you a string too, so that you can tie him during the day, and a post to tie him too. But the little prince seemed shocked by this offer. Tie him? What a queer idea! But if you don't tie him, I said, he will wander off somewhere and get lost. My friend broke into another peal of laughter. But where do you think he would go? Anywhere, straight ahead of him. Then the little prince said earnestly, That doesn't matter. 
Where I live, everything is so small. And with perhaps a hint of sadness, he added, straight ahead of him, nobody can go very far. I had thus learned a second fact of great importance. That was this planet the little prince came from was scarcely any larger than a house. But that did not really surprise me much. I knew very well that in addition to the great planets, such as the Earth, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, to which we have given names, there are also hundreds of others, some of which are so small that one has a hard time seeing them through the telescope. When an astronomer discovers one of these, he does not give a name, but only a number. He might call it, for example, asteroid 325. I have serious reason to believe that the planet from which the little prince came is the asteroid known as B612. This asteroid has only once been seen through the telescope. That was by a Turkish astronomer in 1909. On making his discovery, the astronomer has presented in the International Astronomo Astronomical Congress in a great demonstration, but he was in a Turkish costume, and so nobody would believe what he said. Grown-ups are like that. Fortunately, however, for the reputation of asteroid B612, a Turkish dictator made a law that his subjects, under the pain of death, should change to European costume. So in 1920, the astronomer gave his demonstration all over again, dressed with impressive style and elegance, and this time everybody accepted his report. If I have told you these details about the asteroid and made a note of its number for you, it is on account of the grown-ups and their ways. When you tell them that you have made a new friend, they never ask you any questions about essential matters. They never say to you, what does his voice sound like? What games does he love best? Does he collect butterflies? Instead, they demand, how old is he? How many brothers has he? How much does he weigh? How much money does his father make? Only from these figures do they think they have learned anything about him. If you were to say to grown-ups, I saw a beautiful house made of rosy brick, with geraniums in the windows and doves on the roof. They would not be able to get the idea of the house at all. You would have to say to them, I saw a house that cost 20000 Then they would exclaim, Oh, what a pretty house that is! Just so, you might say to them, the proof that this little prince existed is that he was charming, that he laughed, and that he was looking for a sheep. If anybody wanted a sheep, that is proof that he exists. And what good would it do to tell them that? They would shrug their shoulders and treat you like a child. But if you said to them, the planet he came from is B612, then they would be convinced and leave you in peace for their questions. They are like that. One must not hold against them. Children should always show a great forbearance toward grown-up people. But certainly, for us who understand life, figures are a matter of indifference. I should have liked to begin the story in the fashion of fairy tales. I should have liked to say, once upon a time there was a sheep, prince who lived on a planet that was scarcely any bigger than himself, and who had needed a sheep. To those understand life, that would have given a much greater air of truth to my story. As each day passed, I would learn, in our talk, something about the little prince's planet, his departure from it, his journey. The information would come very slowly, as it might change to fall from his thoughts. It was in this way that I heard, on the third day, about the catastrophe of the Baobabs. This time, once more, I had the sheep to thank for it, for the little prince asked me abruptly, as if seized by a great doubt. Is it true, isn't it, that sheep eat little bushes? Yes, that is true. Ah, I am glad. I did not understand why it was so important that sheep eat little bushes. But the prince added, then it follows that they also eat Baobabs. I pointed out to the little prince that baobabs were not little bushes, but on the contrary, trees as big as castles, and that even if he took a whole herd of elephants away from him, the herd would not eat up one single baobab. The idea of a herd of elephants made the little prince laugh. We would have to put them on top of the other, he said. But he made a wise, made a wise comment. Before they grow so big, baobabs start out by being little. That is strictly correct, I said. But why do you want the sheep to eat the little baobabs? He answered me at once. Oh, come, come, as if he were speaking to some, something that was self-evident. And I was obliged to make a great mental effort to solve the problem without any assistance. Indeed, as I learned, there were on the planet where the little prince lived, as on all planets,
good plant and bad plant. In consequence, there were good seeds from the good plant and the bad seeds from the bad plant. But the seeds are invisible. They sleep deep in the heart of the earth's darkness until someone among them is seized with a desire to awaken. Then this little seed will stretch itself and begin, timidly at first, to push its charming little spring ineffectively upward toward the sun. If it is only sprout of radish or the sprig of a rose bush, one will let it grow whenever it might wish. But when it is a bad plant, one must destroy it as soon as possible, the very first instant that one recognizes it. Now, there were some terrible seeds on the planet that was home of the little prince, and these were the seeds of ba the baobab. The soil of the plant was infested with them. A baobab is something you will never, never be able to get rid of if you attend it too late. It springs over the entire planet. It bores clear through it, through it, it with its roots. And if the planet is too small and the baobabs are too many, they split it in pieces. It is a question of discipline, the little prince said to me later on. When you finish your own toilet in the morning, then it is time to attend to the toilet of your planet. Just so, with the greatest care, you must see it to that. You will pull up regularly all the baobabs, and the very first moment when they can be distinguished from the rose bushes, which they resemble so closely in their earliest youth. It is very tedious work, the little prince added, but very easy. And one day he said to me, you ought to make a beautiful drawing so that the children where you live can see exactly how all this is. That would be very useful to them if they were to travel someday. Sometimes, he added, there is no harm in putting off a piece of work until another day. But when it is a matter of baobabs, that is always a means of a catastrophe. I knew a planet that was inhabited by a lazy man. He neglected three little bushes. So, as the little prince described it to me, I had made a drawing of the planet. I do not much like to take the tone of a moralist, but the danger of the baobabs is so little understood, and such considerable risk would be run by anyone who might get lost on an asteroid, that for once I am breaking through my reserve. Children, I said plainly, watch out for the baobabs. My friends, like myself, I have been striking in danger for a long time without even knowing it, and so it is for them that I have worked so hard over this drawing. The lesson which I pass on this means is worth all the trouble it has cost me. Perhaps you will ask me, why are there no other drawings in this book as magnificent as impressive as this drawing of the Baobabs? The reply is simple. I have tried, but with the others I have not been successful. When I made the drawing of the Baobabs, I was carried beyond myself by the inspiring force of urgent necessity. Oh, little prince, bit by bit, I came to understand the secrets of your sad little life. For a long time, you had found your only entertainment in the quiet pleasure of looking at the sunset. I learned that new detail on the morning of the fourth day when you said to me, I am very fond of sunset. Come, let us look at a sunset now. But we must wait, I said. Wait? For what? For the sunset. You must wait until it is time. At first you seemed to be a very much surprised, and then you laughed to yourself. You said to me, I am always thinking that I am at home. Just so, everyone knows that when it is noon in the United States, the sun is setting over France. If you could fly to France in one minute, you could go straight into the sunset, right from noon. Unfortunately, France is too far away for that. But on your tiny planet, my little prince, all you need to do is move your chair a few steps. You can see the day end and the twilight falling whenever you like. One day, you said to me, I saw the sunset 44 times. And a little later, you added, you know, one loves the sunset when one is so sad. Were you so sad then, I asked, on the day of the 44th sunset? But the little prince made, made no reply. So this is the end of the story I will tell you, and I hope you can read through the end of the story because this is a very interesting one, and thank you for listening.